Well, good morning. We're looking at this question today. Uh, what do you do with the question of Jesus? Who is Jesus? And uh, before we jump into this, I do think we should um, just spend a little time praying for Israel um, this morning. I'm sure you heard uh, that Iran just launched 300 ballistic missiles towards uh, Israel yesterday, and uh, it's just something we should all be praying about. So if we could just bow our heads and pray for a moment. Um, Lord, we just want to pray for uh, your protection over Israel. We pray for just peace. Um, just as your word says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So we're just doing that right now and praying for peace within um, your walls, peace um, and security within your towers. And, and we pray for Israel's salvation too. I know Paul said, like, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them and their salvation. So that's our heart too. It's our desire for the work of God's people to bring the gospel there and the message of peace. And Lord, I just pray um, over all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. We are looking today at one of the highest moments in Peter's life. And um, the events that occur in this passage are so significant, they're mentioned in all three synoptic gospels. It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's also um, echoed in the gospel of John in different ways. Um, and I want to give you a little bit of the context as you're turning to Matthew 16 this morning. Um, the disciples have been together uh, a little over two years now. Um, Christ will soon be crucified. Um, they, they've been hearing the teachings of Christ. Um, they've seen his wonders. They've seen the miracles. Time is starting to get short. And Jesus takes them to this place. It's called Caesarea Philippi. And that's where we're starting in verse 13. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. And if you look at this on a map and see where is Caesarea Philippi, you can still visit there today. Um, beautiful place to visit. It's 25 miles north of Capernaum. So last week we were talking about Capernaum. Jesus takes them about two days journey um, north. The disciples are probably wondering why in the world would Jesus take us here? Um, because this is a a place that was established by Alexander the Great. Um, in fact, they built this shrine there to this Greek god, this false god called Pan. And so the city is sometimes called Paneus. Uh, Pan was supposed to be um, this, this god of nature, um, had like a torso of a man and a hind quarters of a goat, all right? And so the... And, so people worship this false god, and, and they came to this beautiful place, and they turned it, uh, the people there turned it into this evil place of idol worship. And there's a cave, if you go there, and there's an underground stream, and they thought this underground stream was so deep that it was bottomless. Um, Herod later builds this city um, right there, uh, the, and this temple to honor Augustus, and when Herod died, his son Philip took over um, building this city up even more, and that's why it's called Caesarea Philippi. It's located at the base of Mount Hermon. Hermon in Hebrew um, comes from two words, and it means a thing that is devoted to destruction by God. That's, that's what the word means. And Mount Hermon is in a territory called Bashan. And Bashan um, means place of the serpent. Okay, you see where I'm going with this. Um, the Phoenicians worship Baal there. Um, sometimes it was called the mountain of Baal. Uh, the Jewish historian Josephus described the temples there as this, like these temples of white marble um, by the fountains of the Jordan, the place um, that is called Paneum. So you have this place, okay, where false gods um, are worshipped, including these Greek gods, and before that, Baal was worshipped here, and people came to associate this place with the realm of the dead. In fact, that cave I was describing, this cave of Pan, 
um, was called, and you can see it there, it was called the Gates of Hades because of this, this bottomless pit. And it's at this place, the place of the serpent, this dark place, that Jesus takes his disciples. And the light of Jesus just shines through and Christ is seen clearly for who he truly is at Caesarea Philippi. It's just an incredible passage, Matthew chapter 16. And it starts with Jesus just asking the ultimate question there. Um, you're going to see it in Matthew 16, 13. Um, it says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? So he's asking the question. And notice Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Um, he used this title, Son of Man, as a prophetic title for himself. It was his favorite designation um, for himself. If you're looking in the, in the New Testament, uh, how Jesus is referred to, the number one title is Christ or Messiah. The second is the title Lord. But this title, Son of Man, it's most frequently used phrase by Jesus to refer to to himself. And the reason that's so important is because if you want to know who somebody is, you ask them. Right? And Jesus tells you who he is. And out of the 87 times the Son of Man is mentioned in the New Testament, 79 of those times is by Jesus himself to refer to himself. So where else do you see this phrase? You see it in the book of Daniel. Let me just show you this real quickly. Uh, we looked at this last year when we were studying Daniel. Daniel chapter 7 is describing, Daniel gets this vision of, of the end of the world, every major kingdom that's going to happen to the end of time. And in Daniel 7, verse 9, 10, he's describing the books are open, um, our heavenly judge is going to return. And listen to what it says in Daniel 7, verse 9. As I looked, thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days, that's a key title there, Ancient of Days, took his seat, his clothing was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him, a thousand and thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him, the court sat in judgment, and the books were open. Okay, so you, you see right there. This is the end of time. The Ancient of Days is there, clothed in glory. Same thing you see in Revelation chapter 1, verse 12 to 16 that describes Jesus Christ. This is the great I am. This is the Ancient of Days. This is the one who always has been and always will be. The Ancient of Days, right? So, you know, let me just put it to you this way. When, when my kids try to uh, pull some kind of prank or joke on me, you know, I've usually seen them all, right? And I know what they're trying to do, and I'll say, I wasn't born yesterday. You've used that phrase too. I wasn't born yesterday, right? Well, God's saying, I didn't have to be born at all. <laughs> Nothing takes me by surprise. I'm the ancient of days. I see the beginning from the end. I'm from everlasting to everlasting. I'm the first and I'm the last. And jump down a few verses to verse 13 of Daniel 7. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like, listen to this, a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, and that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So Jesus Christ, he refers to himself as the Son of Man, and... <laughs> Lord? <laughs> Okay, make sure I'm uh, saying this right. I don't want to say it wrong. I just think Jesus is referring to himself as the Son of Man, and I, he's not just saying I'm a good teacher, right? He's not just saying, yeah, I'm a good person. He's saying I'm the Son of Man, the Ancient of Days, 
the one who's going to judge the earth. And John, when you get to the book of Revelation, he describes what heaven's going to be like, and he describes these myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands that are falling before Jesus and saying, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen? This is who Jesus is, right? You remember when Jesus was teaching in in this house, and there were so many people just crammed into this house trying to see Jesus that nobody could even get into the house. And there was this paralytic, this paralyzed man who they wanted to bring in. He had four friends that that wanted to get him to Jesus, and they weren't going to let the crowd stop them from getting their friend to Jesus. And one of them comes up with an idea. I got it, guys. Let's come around here. I got an idea. We're going to get on this wall. We're going to carry him up, and we're going to get on this camel. We're going to walk across this camel. We're going to jump onto the roof. We're going to lift him up. And you see how this is a thatch roof? Um, it's made of the, it's like sticks and hay and, 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 and branches and stuff. And we're going to start. And that's what they do. They, they get up there. They get on the roof. And they just start digging. And they start just tearing off this, this roof and the sticks and the grass. And dirt is flying in the house. And they, they start lowering him down in the presence of Jesus. I, I don't have any idea how they're lowering him down into the house, it doesn't, doesn't tell us. I mean, maybe the friends are like, well, he's paralyzed already, so we're just like, well, I guess just, I mean, we got to get him just, whatever we need to do, let's just get him to Jesus, right? And Jesus sees their faith, and he sees this man before him, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven you. You see, that was his greatest need, his sins being forgiven. And the Pharisees see this. They get so upset at Jesus. They're saying, who is this? Who is this guy? You know, that this is blasphemy. This is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? It's just one of the many examples where, where Jesus is making it clear who he is. Right? Jesus says, I'm going to forgive this guy. And the Pharisees say, well, that's blasphemy because you're saying that you're God. And Jesus is saying, yeah, I know. Like, that's the big E on the I chart I'm trying to get you to see. <laughs> and it says in Luke 5, 22, Jesus says to them, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man, you hear it? That you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And immediately he rose up before them, picked up what he had been laying on, lying on, and went home glorifying God. So the Son of Man is the forgiver of sins. Later, he tells, tells his disciples in Matthew 12, he says, just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a great fish, so the Son of Man, the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's saying he, he's going to die and he's going to rise from the dead in three days. He's the Son of Man. When Jesus stood before Caiaphas, the high priest, at the sham of a trial that they put him through in Matthew 26, 64, Jesus said to him, you will see the Son of Man at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. He's making it clear to us. Stephen in Acts 7 He's giving a sermon, and, and he's preaching the gospel, and, and they all pick up stones to stone him, right? And he looks up into heaven and, and sees a glimpse of God's glory, and he says, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. 
This is who Jesus is. He's showing you who he is. So when you get to this passage, you go back to Matthew 16, when he says to his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they start listing some examples. Well, some say you're John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say you're one of the prophets. And if, if you ask an average person today, like, who is Jesus? You're going to get different answers from different people. Um, you know, Ligonier Ministries posted a survey on the state of theology, and I read that to you a couple years ago. This um, survey showed that nearly one-third of evangelicals in the survey, one-third agreed that Jesus was not God. And 65% said Jesus is the first and greatest being created by God. So in other words, one-third of people that are saying, yeah, I'm an evangelical, think Jesus was merely a great teacher. This is why we need to continue to teach Christology. We need to teach the whole counsel of God. And that's why evangelism is so important and discipleship is so important that, that we're showing people who Jesus actually is because there's so much confusion about it. And Jesus says to the disciples, who does the world say that I am? And then he makes it very personal and practical. Who do you say that I am? Not just those people out there. What do you think? Look at verse 15. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Asking the disciples. The disciples that have seen him cast out demons. They've seen him heal the sick and walk on water. They've seen him calm the storms. They've, they've seen him feed the thousands. They've seen him resurrect the dead. Who do you say that I am? And who was the only one that spoke up, Simon Peter. <laughs> and you see this, Peter's profound proclamation is in Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. While everyone else sat in silence, Peter boldly speaks up and gives the church this creedal statement that sums up all of Christian doctrine. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Not, well, I believe, or I personally believe, but I know everybody has their own truth. No, none of that. This is a fact. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Christ, by the way, is not Jesus' last name. It's a, it's a title. It's like Messiah. It's the anointed one, right? And he says, you're the son of the living God. The, the son of God was a royal title, even on a human level. I want you to think about the name of the town they're in, right? Caesarea, named after Caesar Augustus, and they used to deify the Caesars. Augustus was called the son of a god. In Latin, they had a phrase for that, and you see it over some of the signs. It's, you know, Divi Filius, right? Divi, and, and they thought he was like conceived by a serpent. Again, you see the serpent. Augustus had a great uncle named Julius Caesar, and Augustus becomes the adoptive son and heir to Julius Caesar. And why do I tell you that? Because Julius Caesar, it was the same thing. He was declared to be divine after he died by the Roman Senate. Now, if you look at a coin from that day, and I'll show you one. This is a denarius and you'll see on the back side of it, um, Divus Lilius, which means the divine Julius, right? So this was common for them to say this, that the Caesars are divine. 
Now, I want you to contrast this with Peter's statement. Peter says, and he makes a distinction here, you're the son of the living God. You're not just the son of a dead God like Augustus Caesar. You are the son of the living God. Like we just celebrated Easter, right, two weeks ago. And it was such a great celebration, the fact that Jesus is alive, that he's risen from the dead, that he's the only one who uh, raised himself from the grave, right? He said, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up again. So he said, I will raise it up. So Jesus is alive, right? Amen? Can I get an amen to that? Like, Jesus is alive. You know, there's, years ago I heard this song, and I'm not going to sing it for you, but I'll just, I'll read to you some of the lyrics. It's, it's called Jesus is Alive by Shay Lynn. Pretty catchy. Here's verse one. Elvis is dead. Picasso is dead. Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin are dead. Marilyn Monroe is dead. However, Jesus is alive. Brando's dead. James Brown is dead. Princess Di and John Lennon are dead. Biggie and Tupac are dead. However, Jesus is alive. Someone after first service texted me and said, Tupac is still alive, but I (laughs) hate to break it to you. (laughs) Verse 2, Plato's dead, Socrates is dead, Aristotle and Immanuel Kant are dead, Nietzsche and Darwin are dead, however, Jesus is alive. Buddha's dead, Muhammad's dead, Gandhi and Haley Selassie are dead, Elijah Muhammad is dead, however, Jesus is alive. Nero is dead, Constantine is dead, Genghis Khan and Attila the Hun are dead, Alexander the Great is dead, however, say it with me, Jesus is alive. Napoleon is dead, Lao Tzu is dead, Che Guevara and Henry VIII are dead, Saddam Hussein is dead, however, Jesus is alive, amen? So like once in a while you'll hear about somebody that claims to be the Messiah, But when I hear that, my first question is, has he risen from the dead? (laughs) You know? We serve a living God. He's living and active. That's why you keep hearing these confessions from the disciples like Nathaniel in John 149 saying, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. Right? After Jesus walked on water, right, the, the disciples bow down and worship him and they say, Truly you are the Son of God. Andrew, when he brings, um, he goes to find Peter, and he says, we found the Messiah, which means the Christ. When, when Jesus questions the disciples, are you going to go away too? And Peter declares, you have the words of eternal life, right? And we have believed and come to know that you are the Holy One of God. You, you see, God's revealing himself to you. He's doing that even right now. He's revealing himself to you. It says in Matthew 16, 17, Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter's confession didn't come from his own intellect, his own strength. It came from the Holy Spirit. So it says in 1 Corinthians Um, 12.3, it says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit. It takes divine revelation to see and to know Jesus. And the scales of your eyes are finally lifted and you once were blind, but now you can see. This is the miraculous story of salvation. And then Jesus gives you a new identity in this. Look at at verse 18. I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Remember, they're standing in front of this huge wall of stone at Mount Hermon, and Jesus starts talking about this rock. And let me just take a few minutes here, because there is a question Is the rock Peter, or is it his confession and testimony, or is the rock God himself? And so this has been a question of debate throughout the centuries. Uh, Roman Catholics say, no, Peter's the foundation. He's the pope, the first pope of the church. 
um, Protestants say, no, um, this, the statement or the confession is the rock. That's the foundation. Let me give you my understanding of it. Jesus did give Simon this name, Petros, which means the rock, right? We see that in John 1, You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. But we also know, and you read in the Old Testament, it's all over the place, that God is the rock. So I'll give you a few examples. Psalm 18, 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock in which I take refuge. Right? Psalm 18, 31. For who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except for our God? Psalm 62, 1. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock. And my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. In Isaiah 26, verse 4, trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. And you can keep going. Isaiah 44, 8, and so forth. But Christ in the New Testament is also called the rock. Right? The cornerstone. So this is what I think that Jesus is saying. He's saying, you are Peter, Petros, which means a stone, and on this rock, Petra, the word is Petra, which means this massive stone, and I will build my ecclesia, or my church, my community of believers, my body, my assembly, congregation. So Petros, piece of a stone that's chipped from the rock, And then you got Petra, which is this massive rock. So Petros is just one stone in an assembly of stones that is being built upon the rock. So it's not saying that Peter is the Petra, that he's the first pope, that he's infallible, that everything is built on him. No, Peter is not the Petra. The massive stone is the confession of Peter that is the foundation of the church that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's, it's the foundation. I ask that of every person that I've baptized in the past 30 years. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? It's the foundation. Like 1 Corinthians 3.11 No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So all the apostles and the prophets are like secondary stones. And Peter himself, when you get to his book in 1 Peter and 2 Peter, let me just read to you his own words. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. As you come to him, A living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. You yourselves are like living stones, right? You yourselves are like living stones. 1 Peter 1, 5, being built up a spiritual house. Same as 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5, being built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. You're laying a foundation. You're doing that right now. You're doing that when you share Christ. You're doing that when you disciple your children. You're laying a foundation. You're doing that with your grandchildren. You're doing that in your work, in in your ministry. You're doing that in your life. You're laying a foundation for God's kingdom, but Christ is the cornerstone. So the church is not the building. The church is the people of God that belong to Jesus. And we've messed it all up because we've learned this even as a kid. You say, here's the church, and here's the steeple. You learned that, right? And you open it up, and where's all the people? Right? So you, you make this distinction between, well, the church is the building, but where's the people? And God's saying, no, the church is being built up by these living stones that become this spiritual house and the cornerstone of all of it is Jesus Christ and when you put your faith in Christ as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount he's saying he who hears these words and does them will be like a wise man 
who built his house on the what? On the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house, but it did not fall because it was founded upon the rock. Let's go back to Matthew 16, 18. I tell you, you are Peter, Petros, and on this rock, Petra, I will build my church. That's ecclesia. And listen to this. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In other words, the church is going to advance forward. The gates of hell are in Greek here is Hades. Now remember, they're at a place called Pan's Cave. And they had this deep, dark chasm. And they sealed that chasm up eventually, but they, they didn't know how far it went down. So they said, well, that's a bottomless pit. And so the subject of hell would have been a natural subject to bring up here, and Jesus does. And, I, and when I used to, I'll just be honest with you, when I used to read this passage, I used to read it like, well, hell is moving against the church, but the gates of the church are going to withstand the attack of the evil one. But that's not what Jesus is saying at all. What he's saying is the gates of Hades can't withstand the onslaught of the church. Like the church is moving forward. The church is marching on. The church is actually carrying the banner of Christ, the proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and going to all the world. And the gates of hell are not going to prevail against it. So it's a, it's a different paradigm. And Jesus is saying, here, th th these are the keys to the kingdom. Verse 19, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In other words, I'm giving you the authority to proclaim the gospel. And, and I believe this, this binding is it's talking about church discipline there, um, but it's also talking about the graces and the mercy of extending forgiveness, this loosening, um, and, and it's talking about you're going to go forward as these living stones, you're going to be proclaiming the truth, you're going to do the ordinance of the church, you're going to be baptizing, you're going to be taking communion, you're going to be preaching the gospel, and all of us members of the body of Christ are being built up, this spiritual house on the rock of Christ. Does that make sense? If you get it, say got it. Get it? Okay, good. All right, let's keep moving. Verse 20. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Okay, so he's saying, I still got work to do um, before I'm taken, tried, and crucified on the cross. But I want to make it clear, there is a cross coming, and the cross needs to come before the crown. And so he says this in verse 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. So Jesus tells the disciples, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be turned over to the authorities and the chief priests, and I'm going to be murdered. Now, this was shocking to the disciples. And who's going to say something? Open mouth, insert foot. Verse 22. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Jesus? Saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Now, I'm sure Peter meant well with this statement. He doesn't want Jesus to suffer, be killed. Far be it from you, Lord. It's never going to happen. But Peter is talking when he should be listening. <laughs> He's correcting the one that is healing the sick and the blind and lame and feeding the thousands and walking on water and calming the storms and raising the dead. And Peter kind of pulls him aside. Jesus, can you come here for a minute? Jesus, come here. That's never going to happen to you. But he was missing the point. You see, the path to suffering and crucifixion was the mission. 
It was the reason Jesus came. He didn't come to this earth to be comfortable, to have all this fame and this superficial popularity. That's not why he came. This was all a distraction from the main goal, which was to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. That's why he came. And so he gives the harsh rebuke that you see in verse 23. And he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And Jesus gives Peter the harshest rebuke recorded of a disciple. And what's amazing is not long after he commended him for his confession. Why did Jesus say this? Now, I'll just say this really quickly. So you remember at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's in the wilderness after his baptism, and he's being tempted by Satan for 40 days and 40 nights. And Satan says to him, bow down and worship me, and I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world. In other words, you can be comfortable. You don't have to suffer on this earth. I'm reading this book by Adam Hamilton right now called Simon Peter, Flawed but Faithful Disciple. And listen to what he says. He says, Satan is saying, you can have the crown without the cross. And that was three years ago, and now Peter is saying the same thing. That the path we have in this life you know, it's, it's not guaranteed to be easy. In fact, he says it in verse 24. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You know, we have at most 80, 90, 100 years on this earth. But we have an eternity waiting for us. And the choices that you make now determine what your eternity will look like. And Jesus Christ is just putting the ultimate question, not just to the disciples, but to every single one of us. Who do you say that Jesus is? As for me, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, um, I'll just close by saying, you know, in in this chapter, Peter is both affirmed and rebuked by Jesus. He says the right thing, and then he blurts out the wrong thing. Peter speaks more than any other disciple when you're reading through the Gospels. He's also rebuked more than all the other disciples. But as you read the New Testament, it's hard to find someone who confessed Christ more boldly and clearly about the lordship of Christ than Peter. And he's so hit and miss as you're reading this. He has good days and he has bad days, just like every single one of us. And the comfort of it to me is that he's a flawed man who Christ uses in a miraculous way And if God can use a man like Peter, he can use you and me. (laughs) Let's all go to the Lord in prayer right now. Thank you, God, for bringing us to this place to open your word, to be reminded today who you are. And you lay out the question to us. 
Who do you say that I am? If you've never confessed Christ, maybe this is the day. Say it to the Lord right now. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You came to this earth on a mission to die on the cross for my sins. And I ask you, Lord, to forgive me right now of every sin I've ever committed, every sin I ever will commit. Save me, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I pray that all of us here as we go out today, Lord, that you would give us the boldness of Peter to proclaim the truth about who Jesus is. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together.